All right, so let's talk about standing waves. Uh, standing waves are uh, definitely one of the more interesting and complicated uh, concepts in this unit. Uh, so uh, the first thing that I want to start talking about is I want to talk about just like what waves do in general when they, uh, when they hit a barrier. So if I send uh, this uh, particular wave, this blue wave, towards the wall, it's going to hit that wall and, and it bounces off. But an important thing happens when waves bounce off of surfaces. They always invert. So if it was originally an upwards wave, it's now a downwards wave. And that always happens. It doesn't matter what the shape of the wave is. If I had a triangular shaped wave, uh, it would end up inverting. If I had a wave that looked like this, that was like a down triangle uh, and an up triangle, then um, when it inverts, when it comes back, this leading part of the wave will flip over. And this uh, trailing uh, downwards part of the wave will still be trailing, but now it's behind. Uh, so it's going to be moving this direction, and it actually looks like the wave is actually uh, unchanged, but in reality, it flipped over um, as it as it bounced over, uh, and then it's moving the, the opposite direction. So uh, anytime they hit a boundary, waves always uh, flip over. And one important thing to mention then uh, is what happens right as the wave hits the wall. So if you imagine that this uh, this blue wave is hitting the wall, uh, then uh, and it's like halfway through that process, then you can see that I have half of the wave would still be up. But the other half of the wave has already hit and bounced off, and so it's now a downwards wave. So actually, when this wave hits the wall, there would be a moment, and it would be just an instant, but a moment at which the superposition of those uh, of that wave as it interferes with itself actually is destructive interference, and it appears like the wave has vanished. Um, so coming out of all of that stuff um, ends up uh, leading us towards this idea of standing waves. That if instead of sending a single wave pulse that just bounces over and inverts, if I send repeated waves, then those waves are gonna hit the wall and then bounce over and start coming back. But as they're coming back, the returning and inverted waves will interfere with the waves that are going forward. And they'll interfere uh, in different ways over time because both waves are moving, where sometimes they will have destructive interference in some spots, and sometimes they will have constructive interference in, the, in some spots. But because of this uh, interference pattern that ends up happening, we end up getting something that's called standing waves. And what standing waves are is they give the appearance as if we have waves that are staying in one spot the entire time. That's not 100% true. The waves are still being uh, created by whatever the source is, and they're bouncing out, off and coming back towards you. But the net result is that it appears to be uh, standing in place. So the first example, and one, one way that we can think about a, uh, a standing wave, uh, is something that you are probably familiar with, which would be a jump rope. Uh, if you're if you're moving a jump rope up and down at kind of a regular rate, let's just imagine that this is the only side that's allowed to move. If I move it up and down, up and down, we'll end up getting a standing wave that looks like this. It's not always up, it's not always down, uh, and it's not even always all the way up or all the way down. It, you know, it doesn't freeze in place, but it always kind of fluctuates between those uh, those spots. We have the most movement that takes place in the middle and very little movement at either end. Uh, even, even this end that I said was moving up and down, the movement of like somebody who's uh, operating a jump rope is much smaller than the movement that actually happens in the middle. Uh, so this is the first and simplest standing wave. We would typically, in, in my class, I'm going to call this the first uh, harmonic. This is the first wave. N equals one is how I would write it. Just as an aside, different texts and different uh, physicists deal with this in other ways. So some people call this n equals zero. Some people call it n equals one. It will always be clear which one they're using. The AP exam tends to use one, not zero, or it always uses one, not zero. So that's why we're going to go that way. But there are other standing waves that also exist. So the next standing wave that could exist, instead of just going up and down, if I increase the frequency a little bit, then my wave's wavelength is going to get shorter, and suddenly I'm going to have a wave that looks like this, or a standing wave that looks like this. Um, and again, it bounces between those uh, these lines, 
Um, but what ends up happening is uh, if you move the wave quick and if you can find yourself a rope, you can do this yourself, uh, you will have it so that it's like stationary in the middle and we have big oscillations happening here and here and then very little oscillation at any, any of those points. If you go slightly faster, you can get to the next overtone uh, or the next harmonic. And the next harmonic would look like this. My ability to draw these will goes down as they get to higher harmonics, but uh, kind of bounces around again like this, where we have these two spots in the middle that are staying still, and then lots of movement uh, between them. And finally, we can get the last harmonic, not the last harmonic, the fourth harmonic. So we've got n equals uh, two here, uh, then we have n equals three here. Uh, and then our last one we'll call the n equals four. There is no limit. There's there's an infinite number of harmonics that could exist. Although uh, at a certain point, your ability to actually vibrate and move your arm that fast would be limited. Uh, so uh, number four is going to look like, uh, do, do, this is gonna be hard because I don't have guidelines as much to help me out with it, but should be able to get this one. Yeah, there we go. So there's our next one. And what you're, you should notice is that there's like an extra little bit of, uh, little, an extra bump for each one of these harmonics that I'm adding. Uh, so here are our, uh, our standing waves, some very common standing wave patterns. And I need to talk about some vocabulary real, real quick. First thing I wanna talk about is these right here. These are called the boundaries. Those are the limits of either end for the standing wave. Uh, and Depending on the material that you're setting up the standing wave in, you will end up having different boundary conditions. I'll come back to that in a sec. Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about this point right here in the middle. That spot right there, or this spot right here, this spot right there, that spot right there, that spot right there, that spot right there. All of those spots are called antinodes. An antinode is the position at which there is almost no motion happening. And Typically, we would even call these spots here at the ends also antinodes. Uh, so, uh, for example, for, so for this wave, this, uh, this vibrating string, the boundary conditions is that it has to go from antinode to antinode. Uh, that's, that's the only way for it to work on a stringed instrument, for example, like a guitar. Uh, whether you're uh, just plucking the string that's just connected to the guitar or you're holding it down on the fretboard uh, while you pluck it, you've set up boundary conditions for your sound standing wave that limits how long the wave is. Uh, and then that uh, determines what kind of sound it will end up producing. Um, then there's also these spots in the middle. The spots where we have the maximum movement are the nodes. So we have one node here. Uh, we have one node, two antinodes. Uh, in the next one, we have two nodes and three antinodes. In the next one, we have three nodes, four antinodes. Last one, we have four nodes, five antinodes. Uh, they will always be within one of each other. Although depending on the, um, the, the boundary conditions, the material that, or the type of um, kind of instrument that you're dealing with, uh, it's not always that you have uh, one more antinode. It could go the other direction or they could actually be equal to each other. Um, okay, so that's nodes and antinodes. Nodes is where we have maximum displacement. Or if we're talking about uh, something like a sound wave, it's where we would have the maximum air pressure uh, differentials. Uh, at the antinodes is where you have no motion or no change in air pressure, that kind of thing. So the next instrument that we have is a clarinet. Uh, a clarinet is a pretty classic uh, example, although really any instrument that you blow into is an example of this. They all set up standing waves, and depending on how you, you play with the keys or something like that, you're changing the length of the, the instrument, which means you're changing the length of the standing wave, which means you're affecting the sound that it makes. But a clarinet, specifically, since you're blowing into one end, you have motion happening there. So that means that it is a node at the top end. And out of the other end, the air comes out. So it is also a node at the bottom end. So we have nodes on both ends, whereas with a guitar or any stringed instrument, it was antinode to antinode. 
So if we were setting up a, um, uh, a wave inside of here, it would start at antinode positions. Uh, I'm just going to do the simplest wave. It would kind of start at the antinodes and go from there to there. Or the companion wave uh, would. Uh, I'm, that one. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's what it looks like. It would go from node to node. So it would go like that. And like this would be the, the companion to it. That looks wrong. But yeah, that is wrong. Here it is. Sorry. I've now done this a million times and I'm making the video longer than it needs to be. Stop. Anyways, uh, plus it's not even that easy to see. Anyways, so note to note to note to note for a an open pipe like a clarinet or a trumpet or a trombone or really any woodwind instrument tends to be an open pipe, which means the boundary conditions are node to node. The next instrument though is called a closed pipe instrument, and my best example for this would be something like uh, like a, a bottle or a milk jug or something like that, where you blow into the top. And um, you guys have done this before, I'm sure. It makes like a deep tone usually. Uh, and the reason for that is because we have a node at the top, because air pressure can move and, and, and vibrate at the top, but we end up having an anti-node at the bottom because the air pressure can't fluctuate at the bottom, otherwise the material would be flexing and moving. Finally, the last instrument that you need to know about is something like a vibrating tuning fork. Uh, and at least for the vi tuning fork that I'm going to talk about, I'm going to define the tuning instrument as being from the end of the fork to the center of the fork. Uh, and in that case, we would have a node at this end and an anti-node at this end. Uh, it vibrates up here. It really does not vibrate there. Uh, so that's an anti-node. Uh, so those are um, kind of the traditional uh, standing wave instruments, uh, the boundary conditions. Hopefully you have learned what nodes and antinodes are. You know what causes standing waves, these patterns of constructive and de destructive interference. Uh, and you learned a little bit about harmonic numbers and how the waves uh, steadily add more and more antinodes and nodes as we move up to higher harmonics. So thank you for watching. Have a good one.